Well, I too want to thank um, Becky for the invitation to speak to you this afternoon um, about our efforts, particularly with developing vaccine candidates for the prevention or treatment of otitis media. So let me start with the definition of otitis media. Otitis media is an inflammation of the middle ear space or tympanum regardless of etiology. You can have a purely viral otitis media, however, by far, what most of us think about when we think about ear infections in children is really the bacterial component of a viral bacterial superinfection. Now, why do we study otitis media and why can we get funded to study otitis media um, is because of its predominant prevalence in terms of a pediatric disease worldwide. Um, this is the number one reason for physicians' office visits in the age group of 15 years of age or younger. However, otitis media is really a disease of children up to about the age of four. There were 24 and a half million cases of otitis media in the United States in the 1990s, and that represented a 200% increase over that seen a decade prior. This is a five to six billion dollar industry in the United States alone. And the World Health Organization estimates that 65 to 330 million children worldwide are suffering from chronic secretory otitis media. This is also the number one reason for emergency room visits, for hearing loss in childhood, for surgery requiring general anesthesia, and this is for the insertion of tympanostomy tubes that I know a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and it's also the number one reason for the prescribing of antimicrobials. A whopping 40% of all scripts written in childhood are for the treatment of otitis media. And what's happened because of this is the sobering emergence of multiple antibiotic-resistant bacteria in all three genera that are responsible for the induction of otitis media. This um, frightening emergence of antibiotic resistance, which drives antibiotic resistance not only in otitis media pathogens, but in microbes that are, are uh, carried throughout the body, as well as the socioeconomic burden of otitis media is driving vaccine development efforts worldwide. Now, for those of you who don't look um, at eardrums of children or chinchillas, these are actually chinchillas, but they look a lot like kids, <laughs> and I have ENTs who can verify this. This is a normal tympanic membrane. A normal tympanic membrane is flat, translucent, lightly gray. You can see the umbo, the malleus, the first of the three ossicles in the middle ear here. This is a very flexible membrane, no signs of inflammation. In panel B, you'll have what's typically acute otitis media. This is most commonly caused by the organism Streptococcus pneumoniae, very symptomatic presentation of disease. This eardrum is filled with pus and will oftentimes burst, um, which sounds rather disgusting, but is tremendously relieving um, to the child in terms of painful symptoms. The bursting of those tympanic membranes is really the reason, and the relief of symptoms is really the rationale behind the design of tympanostomy tubes. So if you can vent this middle ear space and drain this pus into the auditory canal, you relieve the child of uh, symptomatology of otitis media. It does not prevent the disease, however. In panel C is acute ot or is otitis media with effusion or chronic otitis media. You can see that in absence of the bulging membrane, you still have a tremendous presence of fluid behind the tympanic membrane. You can see this air fluid interface by the bubble here. And the color of those fluids is yellow and red, indicating the presence of pus and blood in the fluid behind the eardrum. So whether you have an eardrum that is bulging and full of pus or bulging um, or not bulging but full of fluid, this is a very compromising condition to both hearing as well as learning to walk because you want to remember that the ear is the organ of hearing and balance. Otitis media occurs in the age group where you're learning to speak and you're also learning to ambulate. So we see a lot of language acquisition delays and developmental delays in children with otitis media. So what are the characteristics of otitis media? Well, it's a multifactorial disease. There are many risk factors for otitis media. If you're a little boy, you're going to have more otitis media than little girls for reasons we don't fully understand. There's a genetic predisposition. And this was shown by the wonderful monodizygotic twin and triplet studies that Margaretha Castlebrandt did at the University of Pittsburgh. Environment influences otitis media. If you live in a home with smokers or you have an open fire to cook your food or heat your home, you're going to have more otitis media. Immunological immaturity just comes with the age group, as does anatomy because children uh, have a, a very horizontal short eustachian tube as opposed to what's present in your in my head, which is longer and sitting at a more steep angle. If you have siblings, you're in any kind of play group, you use a pacifier or you're bottle fed versus breast fed, you're going to have more ear infections. Now, none of these can be controlled really by a vaccination. 
However, these are things that we want to take into consideration as we develop vaccine candidates to prevent otitis media. Otitis media is also polymicrobial, and this is where the microbiology gets very interesting. Any of the upper respiratory tract viruses and some of the enteroviruses can predispose the ear to ascension by one or more of the following bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Moraxella catarralis, or non-typable Haemophilus influenza. These are normal flora members. They are not naturally virulent. However, they are opportunistic pathogens, and they will ascend a eustachian tube, get um, themselves into the middle ear and cause middle ear infections, typically when a child has a cold or an upper respiratory tract infection. It's very important to remember, though, these are members of the normal flora, so they do require a different approach to vaccine development than overt pathogens. And I'm going to be restricting my talk to my favorite microbe this afternoon, which is NTHI, or non-typable Haemophilus influenza. Now, otitis media is also a biofilm disease, and this is a paradigm that's only been appreciated in about the last 10 years. All three bacterial pathogens that cause otitis media have now been shown to cause biofilms, both in vitro and in vivo. Um, and this is a very, very important component of both understanding the pathogenesis of otitis media as well as designing vaccine candidates to prevent it. Now, the rationale for a biofilm paradigm was put forth about 10 years ago by Chris Post and Garth Ehrlich from Pittsburgh, and I can tell you it was uh, almost laughed out of the first meeting when it was presented, and now it's embraced warmly by the entire community, as you can imagine. Science always changes that way. But the reason they put forth this paradigm was because, like other biofilm diseases, like cystic fibrosis or um, contaminated central lines, et cetera, otitis media is difficult to treat with antibiotics. It's often chronic or recurrent in nature. And the effusions that you re can recover from an ear are often culture um, negative. Um, and so this was a big, a, a big problem with otitis media. In fact, early on, people weren't even sure there was a bacterial etiology to otitis media. Nonetheless, if you look at these sterile or culture-negative middle ear fluids, they're often PCR positive for bacterial DNA. Um, after this study was done, the investigators who did the study also found that these middle ear fluids were positive for bacterial messenger RNA. And so that very short, half-lived molecule suggested the presence of metabolically active bacteria present within the middle ear space, even in the absence of ability to culture it. Now, what really brought the community together was a study by Luann Hall Stubley that was published in JAMA in 2006, where she showed um, by confocal scanning laser microscopy a middle ear mucosal specimen, and here you can see some of the nuclei of those cells, um, that were stained with the live dead fluorescent stain and showed the presence of what appeared to be a biofilm-like community in close association with cells that were taken out of the middle ear of a child that was culture negative for bacteria, but PCR positive for Haemophilus influenza. This was a two-year-old with otitis media with diffusion, and she had many, many examples of um, these middle ear mucosa specimens that were associated with what appeared to be a biofilm. Now, we can't obviously go into the ears of children very often in culture, or remove um, mucosa to study. So we had to adapt at the time this discovery was made, was an animal model to, to basically uh, reproduce the biofilm condition in the middle ear space. And my lab works in the chinchilla model, as do many people who work in otitis media, so I'll show you what we developed to study the biofilm in the chinchilla. So to give you a few landmarks, here's the tympanic membrane or eardrum of the chinchilla, and if you were to go up, this would be where the auditory canal was. Um, this thin bone surrounds the middle ear space of a chinchilla. Here's the cochlea, so that's the inner ear. And what you can see is this pulpy mass that's tucked in under the tympanic membrane cleft sitting here in the inferior bulla. And this is a mass that develops if, after you put Haemophilus influenza directly into the ear of a chinchilla about four to five days prior. And when I was training, we just discarded this or disregarded it as a fibrinolytic clot, a fibrous mass, some sort of debris. But if you were to take this mass and snap freeze it over liquid nitrogen and then subject it to a live dead stain where live bacteria are green and dead bacteria are red, you can see the beautiful architecture of the biofilm present in this frozen um, section. So here's the mucosa from this middle air space. And these long, thin, green, finger-like projections that extend into the lumen of the middle ear are, is a biofilm formed by Haemophilus influenza. 
in between these long finger-like communities of bacteria, and there are millions of bacteria present within these fingers, are these dark spaces, and those represent the water channels that feed and bathe this biofilm, both providing nutrients to the bacteria as well as removing any waste from them. Now, these biofilms can reside in the middle of their space or wherever they're built um, for very, very long periods of time. And the bacteria apparently um, periodically are released from this biofilm. They can be released into the lumen, drained through the eustachian tube, um, and reestablish colonization in the nasopharynx. These biofilms are very resistant to treatment of any kind. So these are the fundamental problems with the biofilm diseases or diseases with a biofilm component is that during their chronic and recurrent state, they can act as reservoirs to seed subsequent infections. Uh, they are very recalcitrant to any kind of traditional therapeutic modalities, effectors of innate immunity, effectors of acquired immunity. And, and the standard uh, kind of gold standard for uh, bacteria that are growing in the biofilm is that antibiotic doses in excess of 1,000-fold are required to kill these bacteria versus those that would be required to kill their planktonic form or the forms that are growing free in culture, as you would see in a clinical microbiology lab. So even if you get a good MIC in a clinical lab, you're not going to necessarily get an effective dose in vivo or in situ against a biofilm. So what do we do about diseases like this, and how can we target them for vaccine development efforts? Well, our laboratory decided to look at the proteome of the bacteria when they're growing as a biofilm and see if there were elements of that proteome that we could target for our vaccine development efforts. Now, what this is is a confocal image of a bi bacterial biofilm built by Haemophilus influenza in the middle ear of a chinchilla. Now, what we've stained it for in green is the bacterium that I study, in particular protein expressed by that bacterium called a type 4 pillin protein. And what you can see in blue is a very thick, double-stranded DNA mesh. And this is coming from the PMNs. You can see some nuclei here. The PMNs are attempting to wall off this biofilm in the animal's middle ear. Now, this double-stranded DNA is very, very prevalent, and it's an extremely important and integral part of the biofilm. But what I'm going to talk to you about today, and this, the blue represents a second target of my lab, but what I want to focus you on today is the green. So behind this wall of double-stranded DNA are viable non-typable Haemophilus influenza in the middle ear. And when they're expressing this protein, the type 4 pillin protein, we saw that as an opportunity to perhaps develop a vaccine candidate that targeted that protein that they were definitely and clearly expressing while they were resident in this biofilm community. Now, for those of you who don't think about type 4 pili, um, these, this is a cartoon of a type 4 pilus expressed by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We're working on a model for that pilus for Haemophilus influenza. We don't quite have it done yet. Um, these are surface-bound appendages. They're expressed by a variety of gram-negative pathogens, a lot of the respiratory pathogens and enteropathogens, and they play a very important role in a number of functions that are key in terms of bacterial pathogenesis. They're involved in competence, the ability to take up foreign DNA naturally. They're involved in a form of translocation called twitching motility. They're involved in biofilm formation. They allow bacteria to adhere to mucosal surface, thereby colonizing their host. Now, if you look at this model, here's the bacterial inner membrane. Here's the bacterial outer membrane. Here's the periplasmic space. And what these bacteria do is they make a small protein called pill A. It's the majority subunit. They assemble it into this helical structure or filament that they export through their outer membrane through a hole or a secretin called pill Q in the case of, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This structure then is extruded from the bacterial cell. It sticks to the surface wherever it, it wants to. And then when the bacterium is in the mood, it will rapidly disassemble this, this pillus into its own periplasm thus jerking itself to this contact point. When it jerks its outer membrane to this contact point, it's called twitching. Now, twitching is very important to bacteria because it allows them to sense a quorum and move to wherever they want, allows them to build these biofilm communities. If we were to design a vaccine, or at least our hypothesis was, that targeted this small protein, this pillus protein, and um, obliterate all of these functions in Haemophilus influenza, we thought that that would be a very effective potential vaccine strategy. Now, before we did that, we had to prove that Haemophilus made type 4 pili. Um, this organism has been known for over 130 years as a non-modal organism. And you can see that uh, my lab, in collaboration with the Munson lab, 
in around 2005 demonstrated that these bacteria were indeed modal, and they did indeed express a type 4 pilus, and you can see that in this electron micrograph. This bundle of structures extending off a subpolar location are type 4 pili, and you can see this pilus is labeled with antibody that targets that subunit protein here in panel B. Now, before you can design a good vaccine candidate, you have to make sure that your organism is indeed expressing that protein in vivo when it's causing the disease. Otherwise, you don't have the target that you're aiming for. So I want to show you a study we did in chinchillas where we put the pill A promoter upstream of a luciferase cassette on a plasmid in Haemophilus influenza so that these bacteria were glowing white whenever they expressed the type 4 pillus. Now, this white light is being read by a xenogen imager ex vivo. Here's a chinchilla snout. Here's its paws, its whiskers. It's laying on a warming blanket. And on day zero, right after we let this, uh, this animal breathe in Haemophilus influenza that was grown on chocolate agar, we let it breathe in the organism about 10 to the 8th CFU, and we put 1,000 CFU in each of its right and left ears. Now you can see right off chocolate agar, you have a little bit of expression of the pillus. Um, but we're not reading this white light from the middle ears because that bone is obscuring bacteria when they're at the load that we put into the middle ears, or 1,000 CFU. However, as those bacteria begin to multiply, that white light signal does come up, and you can see that the bacteria have now distributed themselves throughout the nasopharynx. We know that they're, the bacteria are there, but the density is now too low to be read ex vivo. However, we're starting to pick up light emission from both middle ears as this bacterial load increases, and there's more white light. By day two, we have robust bilateral otitis media in these animals, and the expression of luciferase is telling us clearly that this organism is expressing the type 4 pillus, or at least the pill A protein, when it's resident within the middle ears of this animal. And what happened that was interesting although uh, discouraging at first when we didn't understand it, was that at day four, when we know by histology and microbiology there are big biofilms present in the middle of the ears of these animals, we lost this white light signal. Well, those of you who work with luciferase know that that chemical reaction is dependent on the presence of available oxygen. Biofilms are known for being microaerophilic or anaerobic when they become mature. So we wondered if in these mature biofilms there wasn't enough free oxygen for us to be able to read the expression of luciferase ex vivo. So what we did was we opened up the ears of this animal and we looked in those cavities and you could see this big pulpy mass present within the middle ears of the animals. When we exposed those middle ears, both the right and the left bullae in the xenogen imager, you can see the white light emission from both halves of the middle ear. And to make sure that we weren't just picking up bacteria that were adherent to the mucosa that were indeed within a biofilm, we removed the biofilm physically from the middle ear spaces, washed them, and then imaged the biofilms themselves separately. And you can see, again, luciferase expression from that biofilm material, suggesting the Haemophilus influenza, when it was forming a biofilm in the middle ear of a mammal, was indeed expressing the type 4 pillus. So what we, what we made, did I do that? What we made was a recombinant soluble version of the pill A protein. We clipped the end terminal tail because it's made of a lot of hydrophobic amino acid residues. It makes it difficult to work with in vitro. We made this recombinant soluble pill A vaccine candidate, made it as a, a six his tag protein, but then clipped the his tag for immunization. And this became our vaccine candidate. And I want to show you some trials done in a chinchilla host, but I want to explain to you just briefly what our candidates were that we were immunizing with. Um, this is a candidate called LB1. It's a chimeric synthetic peptide immunogen de designed after a totally different adhesin expressed by Haemophilus influenza. And this I made with my collaborator and good friend Pravin Kumaya when I was just out of my postdoc, so this has been around a while. Um, here's the recombinant soluble pillus candidate, um, RS pill A. And then um, to make things interesting, to make a vaccine that might carry the power of two different um, immunogens on one molecule, we made something called ChimV4. This is a chimer that's comprised of RS pill A as the carrier. And then here on the tail, remember I told you we clipped the end terminus of this protein. What we replaced it with was the underlined yellow sequence from this vaccine candidate. So we made a chimeric vaccine candidate. Um, and basically, this one's directed against the pillus only. This one's directed against P5 only, 
and this candidate is directed against both candidates. Now I can tell you that these candidates have all done very, very well in parenteral, a preclinical vaccine trial. So when we deliver them subcutaneously, they've all done very well. But I thought what might be of interest to you today is to hear something new that we're doing in my lab. Early on in my talk, I mentioned that 65 to 330 million children have chronic secretory otitis media worldwide. The majority of that burden is borne by children in the developing world. Children in the developing world, they're never going to be able to afford the vaccine candidates that we are developing. So one of our initiatives now is to develop some non-invasive and cheaper vaccine candidates for use in the developing world. So we're working on intranasal vaccines, sublingual vaccines, and one I want to tell you about today, which is a transcutaneous approach. Now, there are multiple advantages to transcutaneous um, immunization in that they ease pain and anxiety, thereby increasing compliance. They eliminate the use of needles and the need for trained personnel to, de to uh, deliver these um, vaccines. They're typically cheaper. These can be formulated so that no cold chain is needed. And I mentioned this earlier, the, the absence of need for trained medical personnel. This can help with the now very crowded pediatric injectable vaccines um, regimen that's causing a lot of parents to kind of pull back from standard pediatric immunizations. And most importantly, it has the power to induce both a systemic and a mucosal immune response. Otitis media is a mucosal disease, and thereby we were very encouraged by the potential transcutaneous immunization had. The skin is the largest immune organ of the body. The adjuvant that we're going to use is one developed my, by my friend John Clements. This is from E. coli heat labile enterotoxin, where he's done, made a double mutation. He's switched an arginine to glycine at position 192, and a leucine to alanine at position 211. Um, the reason he's done this is to render the trypsin-sensitive uh, cleavage site inactive. And this takes the toxicity away from this endotoxin, but allows it re to retain its adjuvant-like properties. So this was our uh, third transcutaneous immunization attempt. And I can tell you, even by attempt three, we were doing a little bit of guessing, because this had never been done in a chinchilla before. But this is what we did. There's a chinchilla. We marked off a one centimeter square on their ears. This is the skin of their ears. We hydrated it with a little bit of sterile pyrogene um, saline to loosen up the junctions between the cells that are on the surface of the skin. We put our vaccine on the animal's ear, and we just rubbed the ear together. We did this twice, uh, two weeks apart. And then we challenged these animals by a very rigorous challenge regime where we allowed them both to breathe in Haemophilus influenza and we put it directly into the middle ears. And this is the most robust challenge model that we have. On days 3, 7, 10, and 14 after challenge, we did a nasopharyngeal lavage to see how many bacteria they were carrying in their nasopharynx, as well as tap their middle ears if they had an ear infection. Now, remembering that bacteria that cause otitis media naturally are going to come from the nasopharynx travel up into the middle ear. This colonization aspect of this model was to determine whether we were having an effect on colonization or carriage of this normal flora. The cohorts were established as so. LB1, if you remember, was the P5-directed vaccine candidate with the adjuvant LT. RS A is the type 4 pilus candidate with the same adjuvant. The chimer is the combination of these two antigens with the adjuvant LT. And then the adjuvant alone cohort served as an adjuvant-only control. This is what we saw in these animals when we were looking for how many bacteria they were carrying in their nasopharynx. Those animals given adjuvant alone, all animals were challenged with 10 to the 8th CFU. The animals with adjuvant alone pretty much did what you would see in any non-immunized or non-specifically immunized chinchilla. Slowly, you see the load reduced to about 10 to the 4th, and it will stay this way for about seven weeks in this animal's. In the animals that got any of the vaccine candidates, you can see a very early push down of bacteria out of the nasopharynx by 10 to 14 days after challenge. Now, these are the numbers of bacteria per mil of nasopharyngeal lavage fluid, but if you look at the percentage of colonized animals in those cohorts, you can see similarly that the animals that were given the adjuvant only remained heavily colonized to the end of the study whereas all three cohorts that received an immunogen did push those bacteria out of the nasopharynx, resulting in non-colonized animals within two weeks of transcutaneous immunization. Now, what happened in the middle ears of these same animals? Well, what typically happens in chinchillas that are challenged with about 10 to the third or 1,000 CFU if they're non-immune, 
those bacteria will rapidly multiply, achieving bacterial loads between 10 to the 7th and 10 to the 8th CFU per mil. But you can see in these animals immunized with any of the three test immunogens, and particularly the chimer, which hits two targets of Haemophilus influenza, not only did they hold back this initial multiplication of these bacteria, but they rapidly pushed these bacteria out of that middle air space. And this was um, extremely significant statistically in chinchillas, which are outbred mi mixed-sexed animals. So getting something of this statistical power in that model is a little bit more difficult than in a, um, in a, a mouse that is more of a purebred animal. This is the result in terms of percentage percentage of culture positive middle ears from these animals, and again, a really remarkable clearance of bacteria considering that this was a non-invasive immunization strategy and only two doses were required. So I want to conclude to keep me on time today that targeting the proteome of the non type of homophilus biofilm for the design and development of vaccine candidates has shown promise in our lab. I haven't shown you any of the traditional uh, parenteral preventive strategies, but I can tell you the efficacy has been as good as that we've seen with the non-invasive preventive. And one of the things my lab is working on right now is non-invasive therapeutic strategies. So we're going ahead and letting biofilms form in these animals' middle ears, and we're trying to immunize them to resolve infection, hoping that this will be effective for children in that older age group that already have an ongoing otitis media recurrence um, in place. There's continued development of type 4 pulse-based strategies in my lab, not only for otitis media, but we're also now looking at sinusitis, chronic cough, bronchitis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, because the same organism causes diseases throughout the respiratory tract of man. I want to thank the members of my lab, particularly those individuals in blue whose hands did the majority of the work you see here today. My collaborator, uh, Bob Munson, who I discovered the type 4 pillus with, and we also invented RS Pillay and the Chimer together. John Clements, my friend um, from Tulane University, who's taught me all things about adjuvants, particularly DMLT. And I'm always grateful for funding from the NIH, both NIDCD and NIAID as well as my industry partner for the last 18 years, GlaxoSmithKline Biologicals in Belgium. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take your questions. Very excellent explanation of rationale behind it. Thank you. Any questions? I have two questions. Yes. So first of all, do you know what the I can actually answer both for you. So just to get at the beginning of what's going on, at least in the transcutaneous immune response, um, is that we are isolating cells when we deliver this immunogen with a fluorochrome, CFSE, for example. We can track those, the draining dendritic cells, primarily to the NALT as well as to some of the... Um, the draining lymph nodes, and you can see that this fluorescent population of dendritic cells are dermal dendritic cells as opposed to Langerhans cells. So the dermal dendritic cells are what we were targeting, are really the power behind this response. They induce the immune response very strongly locally, and that we believe is responsible in addition to some of the cytokines for clearance of bacteria. And I can tell you why these uh, organisms are not inducing an effective clearing immune response. If you look at the immune response to the pilus protein in animals that are just colonized or in humans, that are simply colonized with Haemophilus influenza, the immune response is strongly directed to the end terminus of this protein. Um, if you map that with peptides and under immunization conditions or naturally recurring disease where the animal or the child or the adult man or woman has clear disease, that response has been shifted to the C terminus of that peptide. So our immunization strategy, notice we've clipped the N terminus. We don't want to distract the immune response. We're redirecting to the C terminus of that protein. Yes? Yep. And it's something that you have to process all kinds of things. And there's a lot of evidence now in which you're actually able to do that building relating to the problem of only resistance to the A vaccination process like this doesn't really have to be our practice. Is there anything that you can 
Um, not only do I think there's a role, but we should talk because I, the earlier slide, earlier slide I showed with the big double-stranded DNA, that's another target of one of the um, platform technologies we've been working on with USC. And in fact, we're targeting specifically people like you who are putting any sort of artificial device, it doesn't matter where, in the body, eventually you get failure uh, very often. And what we're trying to do is either use an immunization approach, but also a therapeutic approach to infuse those implants, to infuse those devices with something that can help prevent these from forming. Because you know, once they're formed, all you can do is pull it. You know, you can pull the trach, pull the line, pull the implant, whatever. Um, we're trying to be a little more proactive in that because eventually biofilms will grow in almost any body cavity. We should talk. <laughs> we will. Yes. I'm sorry. I. We used LT as the adjuvant in this study. Um, it's working its way through. Probably next, the one the one you'll see next is MPL. It's a derivative of Salmonella Minnesota endotoxin monofasciral lipid A. But LT is already being used in Europe in a number of vaccine trials in the clinics, and we expect it to be used in the United States in the near future as well. Very powerful. In the case of otitis media, otitis media is largely um, an antibi antibody. Um, you can mediate a cure through antibody alone, although I would never want to discount the role of cellular immunity in that clearance response. But you can deliver antibody passively and mediate a cure of otitis media, at least in animal models. JB? You know, I, I, I don't have as much experience with small molecules as I do biologics, and so I, am, I imagine that the same rigor would be applied, but you just have different endpoints. In one case, you're doing a directed therapy, and the other, you're hoping the immune response, you're needing the immune response of your host to mediate the effect that you want. And so um, I, I don't know that there's that much difference in terms of timeline, but people always ask me how long it's taken to get this <laughs> vaccine from its inception. Um, to now, and I can tell you it's been 18 and a half years, so it's <laughs> it's a marathon, not a sprint. But I think part of that's because I'm targeting two-month-old babies, and, and you've got the diligence is, is extreme, as, as it should be for a pediatric target. So I, I'm not sure, and think small molecules, it also depends on your target audience, whether it's cancer or whether it's um, an infectious disease. 